and welcome to the Chamber Foundation's Path Forward series. Today, we're taking a long-term look at how the United States can maintain our nation's economic competitiveness. At the U.S. Chamber, we believe that free enterprise is our ultimate competitive advantage, and the spirit of competition that underpins our free enterprise system has allowed this country to build the most innovative, resilient, and dynamic economy in history. But none of that is possible without public policies that allow businesses to discover solutions, create cures, and solve problems. With our experts here, we will unpack how we can foster an ecosystem where innovation can thrive and big ideas can become reality. Core to that mission is ensuring private sector research and development is supported and strengthened. We've seen how R&D enables entrepreneurs to invest in breakthroughs that make life better and the private sector's stunning capacity for innovation was showcased for the world in the race for COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics. These were made possible by decades of R&D, supported by strong IP protections and the chance for businesses to make a return on very costly endeavors. But we cannot take this for granted. Our public policies must provide a critical base for maintaining American competitiveness, ensuring our economic security, and delivering essential innovation. We will unpack the current state of R&D and what the U.S. must do to continue to lead the world in innovating new solutions that solve problems and strengthen society. Joining us today is Dr. Bruce Guile, Project Lead for Global Innovation and National Interests at the BRG Institute. We're also delighted to welcome Dr. France Cordova, President of the Science Philanthropy Alliance and the 14th Director of the National Science Foundation. So let's get right to it. Starting with you, Dr. Cordova, you know, this program, The Path Forward, really started in the pandemic as we were thinking about a path forward through COVID-19 and the economic disruptions that were, of course, following such tragic human loss. And so, well, as I said a minute ago, it was remarkable to see the R&D that led to such quick development of therapeutics and, and of, of vaccines. We were really ill-prepared to deal with the pandemic. Ill-prepared might even be a diplomatic way to say what happened in this country and around the world. And so as you think about coming to the other side, potentially, of this pandemic, what do we have to do to prepare for the next one? Well, Suzanne, first I'd like to thank you for including me in this conversation. Uh, and uh, you're, you're absolutely right. If because of decades of investment in research and development, we were able to respond very well to the COVID-19 virus. Uh, we're, we're not very good at planning ahead for emergencies. It's easier for us to gather forces and to respond quickly to them. And that means that we have to have a storehouse of intellectual tools and, and uh, technical tools in order to meet them. So there's a lot more emphasis today, uh, really because of the pandemic, on in envisioning the future and envisioning ways that we can, for example, have an antidote to all viruses that are similar to uh, COVID-19 instead of doing it one by one as they come along. So what I'd like to place emphasis on in um, my <clears throat> remarks today is that we have good data on R&D <clears throat> in order to make wise policy decisions. And uh, as you mentioned, I was the director of the U.S. National Science Foundation for six years, a full term. And uh, the National Science Foundation has a center for statistics on science and engineering. And because of the congressional mandate, uh, they put these statistics out every couple of years. They update them continually, but they put out a formal report every couple of years. And it's just a treasure trove of information that really helps us make wise policy decisions about R&D. The report is policy neutral, but it's very policy relevant. And it includes data on publications and patents, the size and demographics of the science and engineering workforce, and tells us how science education is faring. All of this in a global uh, context. And I think the bottom line from these data and also data that the American Association for the Advancement of Science puts out based on the latest data from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development called OECD. It's 38 countries that get together 
lot of data, show us that the, the U.S. is no longer in all areas in the top position in R&D in the world. It is number one or number two in different areas, but we have competition. And so that means we have to get going. We have to really think carefully about our investment in research and development in order to be really the leader among nations in addressing uh, things like pandemics, a climate change, any number of global challenges that we have. So that's interesting to think about R&D competition globally in different categories. What, what do you see as our biggest challenge here in the United States? Years ago, uh, right, right after we had made one of these reports on science and engineering indicators, I was overseas for a conference and uh, a, a leading light in science came up to me and he said, what have you been working? I said, well, we're relieved. We just got the indicators published again. And he said, can you say in one word what the biggest challenge is that the indicators reveal? And mind you, this was several years ago. And I said, yes, I, I actually can say it in one word. And that word is China. The growth and development of China is arguably our largest R&D challenge. The U.S. has long led the world in R&D spending, but China's gained rapidly in recent years. Uh, since two, the year 2000, so for the last decade and more, uh, the investment in R&D in, in China has increased by 14% a year on average, a growth rate that's four times that of the U.S. And as a result, if you look at the number of scientific publications, China leads, U.S. is second. If you look at the number of patents, patents that are relevant to technological developments, China leads. If you look at the number of science and engineering, especially in the physical science, computer engineering uh, students that are being produced in college, China's leading. So uh, I, I think that that is, uh, is a really big challenge. And lots of other nations are also really stepping up their in investment in R&D so that the US now ranks only number six in what we call R&D intensity, which is the ratio of your R&D investment as compared to GDP. So number six among the uh, prominent countries in the world. So what's the solution? I think it's to invest more in basic research because that's the seed corn of technologies that have application to our economy, our health, and our standard of living. And that's frankly why I have my current job post National Science Foundation, which is to lead an alliance of almost 40 private foundations that want to accelerate investing in basic scientific research. What do you see as private enterprise, as industry's role in this? I, well, industry has a very large role as an investor in, uh, in R&D. In fact, overall, in, in all of research and development, they are the biggest investor. And that's industries writ large, overall industries. And um, if you parse that out, you see that that's mainly because of their investment in development, not in uh, applied research or basic research. There, they would be uh, below, say, government funding and uh, competing with private philanthropic and university funding. But uh, they are a very uh, significant developer, uh, um, contributor to investment in R&D. And, and I see a lot of companies uh, doing things like partnering with others. They're partnering with the federal government. They are starting even, um, they're starting foundations and they're starting uh, research organizations even within the industry in order to make more investment in these parts, um, uh, the special interests of the industry. So they're, uh, they're a, a, a really a force in the whole R&D enterprise. So when you think about industry, private foundations, government R&D, what's the right mix if we were going to become more competitive as a country? Ah, uh, the right mix. I, 
I think the, uh, I, I, I don't have a, a number for the right mix. I just think everybody should invest more and they should do it very strategically, thoughtfully. Uh, they should be, you know, watching what other sectors are investing in and thinking how they can complement them. You know, I'm impressed, for example, with um, more recent partnerships since, uh, mainly since 2019 with, of industry with the government in fields like artificial intelligence and quantum science, two very big areas. And of course there's biotechnology. Uh, th those are all very big uh, areas that are absolutely essential for us to rank right at the top in order to be competitive among nations, competitive in the health sense, in an economic sense, obviously in the defense uh, sense. So there's there's no no magic numbers, but just uh, just invest more, realizing how very important it is to our economic success. So there's investing funds, and then there's investing in education. So you know, at the chamber, we're always trying to figure out kind of a chicken and egg thing: is the issue K through 12 education and not enough emphasis on math and science? Is the issue uh, attracting more people into STEM majors in college and going on to postgraduate degrees is the problem industry attracting people into those careers. And before you say all of the above, uh, what do you think we should be prioritizing as, as a solution? Well, there, you know, I, I, I do want to say all of the above <laughs> because uh, inspiration comes from so many different sources. And, and let me just summarize in a sentence my own path. I was not encouraged as a woman to go into science and engineering, even though I loved it as a very young person. In fact, I was actively discouraged. I majored in English in college, got out of college, uh, saw a show on science on public television, and I said, yes, that's what I want to do by the time I'm 30 years old. So, so for me, you know, investing in, uh, in, in shows, in uh, social media and in, in television and so forth uh, with these special programs that industry and others, uh, of course, help support is just can be a real source of inspiration. Uh, there are major achievements like look at the James Webb Telescope uh, science productivity over the last couple of weeks and all the wonderful images that have come from that. It's like when we landed on the moon. I think it was for a whole generation of young people to go into uh, science and engineering careers. Uh, I, I think there, there are just so many things that can be done. Uh, it, it's interesting to me as I, I think about when I was uh, in college about how few women were lawyers, how few were medical doctors, how few were scientists and engineers. Well, today that's really changed for medicine and law. You see lots of amazing women just making spectacular uh, progress in, um, in law and uh, medicine. In science, Definitely making progress, not as much. We're missing a lot of women relative to our population in science. I think, why is that? And, and then I think, well, you don't get introduced to medicine and law until you're you know, late in college and professional school after college. So you're not going to have a medical course or a legal course, most likely when you're in high school or grade school, but you will have science. And I think it's up to uh, all of us to ensure that that science it's not something that turns people away from the field, but actively encourages them. And so I think we need to reward science teachers with both salary and, uh, and awards for achievement. We need to have the science fairs and the prizes because we know from the experiences of scientists that those really inspire and encourage them, give them the confidence to become a scientist. We need to have a lot more high school and college summer programs with hands-on activities, more internships in industry. I was also the president for a time of Purdue University, and it was one of the uh, leading universities for having industry internships over the summer. And the result was that the students got, they loved their experience and they took the jobs in industry. So that's a very good way to uh, excite students. And the positive role models everywhere can't be discounted, the importance of that. So I wanna 
pause and bring Dr. Kyle in, but let me ask you one last question. What do you think is holding us back from prioritizing the types of solutions that you've outlined? Uh, uh, I, I don't think it's lack of knowledge about how we're doing. For example, in the indicators that I mentioned and, and the other uh, data show that uh, among the 38 OECD nations, we scored just average in science in K through 12 and below average in math. And, and I think most people know that our scores are not high in, until you get to college. And there, there's just much more investment in having quality teachers and instruction experiences for students. What, what's holding us back is really uh, having the, the commitment, the will, the strategic planning to get together on a more local level because, you know, K through 12 is really um, is a local phenomenon and a state phenomenon. It's not something that's run by the federal government. And realizing that we have a responsibility here and trying to join the, the universities and colleges that care about this question and the community action groups and seeing where we can make a difference at that level to exciting students, to not uh, discouraging them as I was discouraged from science, but to give them the confidence and, uh, and the real interest. What a beautiful world that science can offer them uh, for uh, participating in discovery and in really making impact on our world. Well, Dr. Cordova, we so appreciate you being with us today. I'm sure there's a lot more we could ask you, but I do want to pause and bring Dr. Guile in. So thank you so much for your insights. And uh, turning to you, Dr. Guile, let me ask you, I'm going to assume that you agree with Dr. Cordova on uh, how the United States is doing in terms of long-term competitiveness and R&D investment. Is that right? Um I would say that there was no daylight between where France is and where I am 36 months ago. But I think I've taken um, a kind of hard turn to the right in a, in a not in a bad way, but in a, in a, in a different way, I think. Um, so I, I completely understand France's description of what's going on with regard to you know, Chinese investment in science and the publications and the growth there and the U.S. being you know, no longer the most R&D intensive economy. But I think we need to back up just a little bit and recognize that the position we were in coming into, you know, the last decade um, basically was predicated on our success at the end of World War II. And frankly, everything changed at the end of um, the Cold War. Uh, and I don't think that we've quite as a country uh, sort of stepped up and understood that much of our competitiveness, the, the sort of the tech-based, innovation-based competitiveness was a product of being the, you know, the biggest guy on the block. And we're now in a position where US R&D, public and private, is less than 30% of the global total. And that's down from almost 70%, you know, in the 60s and early 70s. So what we've seen is this is not us falling behind in a sense that we can catch up by investing more. This is a sense in which the rest of the world has doubled down and gotten better both at R&D, they've gotten better at lab to fab, and they've gotten better at innovation. So we're now no longer you know, miles ahead of the competition looking back over our shoulder only once in a while, we are literally footsteps ahead of other countries who are investing just as much and much more strategically than the US has in the past. So let me pause there and see if I've made that point sufficiently and then I'll let you go to your next question if you want. Uh, yeah, I think that's really interesting and maybe scary, right? Because it's, it's not just about what we can do but what the competition can do. And so maybe it's a it's an American trait to think, what can we do? How else can we do it better? What could we invest? Um, but we're not the only people in the race. I think that's, that's a really important point. Right. Maybe broadening it, I would ask you to talk about kind of why this matters to business and what business's role in the solution is. Um, so a couple, a couple things I would say about that. One is, 
business, I completely agree with France. Business is a very important player. And in, and in large part, they are the biggest investor in D and innovation. Okay. But they do not invest very much in R. And a lot of what matters in terms of economic security, which is sort of my version of the replacement for economic competitiveness, a lot of what matters is um, how well you take advantage of advances in science and tech to you know, profit from them, to you know, create jobs, all of the things that go downstream from the research lab. And it isn't just in R&D that we've lost you know, sort of market share. We've lost market share in all these other functions. Right now, you know, China, Chinese manufacturing capability is incredible. And it's not something that, you know, appeared overnight. They've invested aggressively. And um, so we have a, you know, a, a fierce competitor, not necessarily in R&D, but in pure manufacturing capability. Um, the other thing, which I don't, I don't mean to, you know, I'm not disparaging business here, but there's a sense in which I don't think most people really grab or grasp the notion that um, most global supply chains are their own innovation ecosystem. So it's not just that you know companies have you know stolen jobs from the U.S. and outsourced. What's happened is is that capability has grown overseas. And so a U.S. you know original equipment manufacturer works with suppliers around the world and products cross the borders you know, daily and 15 times for different you know components. And at the end of the day, the innovation ecosystem which we rely on is as much overseas as it is domestic. And so it's not that business is expected to solve that problem, but they live now in a world of global competence so they can tap capability and talent overseas as easily as they can tap it across the street. And that creates a national economic security problem because it means that in things like, for example, you know, rare earth minerals, we depend on supply chains across the world for things that happen you know, in our communities. And at the end of the day, that vulnerability is not something that we've understood and yet somehow companies need to participate in reducing that vulnerability. And I don't think we have the mechanisms yet. The long answer to a short question. Sorry, Suzanne. No, I thought it was a really important question. And I, and I don't mean to go off topic here, but I, I take your point, but I also think there's a role for government. You know, I'm just back from Berlin and if you're in Berlin right now, mm -hmm. you have German companies and CEOs talking about how they're going to deal with potential rolling blackouts, you know, how German oh. citizens are going to deal with potential rolling blackouts. Mm -hmm. And then you come back to the United States and we have a hard time talking about domestic energy production as a national security and economic security force. And we have a hard time balancing that with, uh, okay, we're good at technology, we're good at innovation, yes. let's stop pretending things are binary and do two things at once. Let's get right. the security we need in domestic production and mitigate climate through technology right. and innovation. Right. There's something about us pretending things are binary that aren't binary that I think is keeping us from a solution. So I don't mean it's government's role, but in order for business to do what you just said, we're going to need more workers. We're going to need more permitting. We're going to need access to rare earth minerals here in the United States. And these are things business can't do alone, right? Absolutely. You know, I think there's also this tendency, I mean, it's not, once again, it's not business's fault, but since the end of the Cold War, you know, globalization has been the watchword. And if you ask yourself how many of the top, you know, 50 U.S. companies in terms of market cap, especially the tech companies, existed before the end of the Cold War, almost none. So what you have is a generation of U.S. companies and, frankly, a generation of government leadership that is deeply unprepared for confrontation and conflict in geopolitics because they have no experience. And so in Berlin, the discussion is a, a high degree of alignment between the business leaders, you know, many who have been in those positions or companies that have existed for decades, and the government. And the same thing is true in Japan and in many countries that have older companies. In the US, our tech companies are global creatures, and there is this sense in which 
they do not feel particularly beholding to the U.S. government, which will, of course, change and change dramatically with the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. But if we look at something like, and I, you know, I hate to bring this up, if you look at a potential, you know, ice cold relationship with China or even a potential hot war, U.S. companies will wake up very quickly to the necessity of behaving differently than they have in the past. But we need some, I think, external shock or shocks to realign the government agenda with regard to companies and the company's behavior with regard to global geopolitics. I think it's an interesting question, and it gets to another topic related, which is commercial diplomacy. You know, is mm -hmm. there a role for business to play in strengthening alliances? In, in the topic of this episode, which is in R and D, is there yeah. more we should be doing together with our allies? A absolutely. You know, one of the one of the great um, one of the great uh, tragedies, I think, of um, of what's going on in the world is that governments collaborate on science. There's a there's a science diplomacy. There's international collaboration in science, and companies collaborate across national borders all the time. But there is no mechanism domestically or internationally for collaboration among public-private collaboration that crosses national borders. And it is a critical uh, need for the liberal democracies to be able to work together on things ranging as strange, you know, it's a wide ranging set of topics. It's the next generation of wireless um, in competition with Huawei. It's orbital space where the Russians and the Chinese may not play nice when it comes to dealing with you know, cleaning up space, space debris and controlling orbital space. Um, there's just a long list of topics where we really do depend on the private sector to implement things for us as democracies. And yet somehow we do not have the mechanisms to bring them to the table with governments to address these questions on a collaborative international basis among the other democracies. So I, I could talk to you all day. I have a million questions for you, but let me try to end on, mm -hmm. uh, end on one that lifts up a little bit, which is as you think about the technologies we're just getting into as a country, whether mm -hmm. that's AI or quantum or, you know, things that feel cutting edge right now. What do you see as important both in terms of US national security, but also long term economic growth and security? Um, I have a, a slightly uh, counterintuitive approach, which is don't pick the technologies, pick the problems. OK, and so you know, if you pick the technology of you know, launching satellites or cleaning up space debris, you miss the issue that the problem among the liberal democracies is lack of effective collaboration in commercial space and in things like space situational awareness. Um, the, the problem I would pick on for um, other areas, uh, for example, you know, the AI and, and quantum computing and communication are all tied up with what you would call future industries that have to do with the combination of wireless, landline, and these containerized AI and computational approaches. So the problem is, how do we move as a set of democracies into the, into the future in particular industries? And different technologies are component parts. And yes, you need to invest in those technologies, but what you really have to do is figure out what the problem is and address the problem. And part of the solution will be a technological solution. That's a great place to end a program about R&D and science on the, on the human component and human conditions. So thank you for that, Dr. Gao. We'll look forward to our next conversation very much. Peace. It was real joy. It was real pleasure. Thank you so much. And to the audience, thank you for tuning in. We'll look forward to sharing details of our next program with you soon.